Hello and welcome to the next relatively poorly titled le video lesson. Um, the standard disclaimer, this is not going to cover specific information with the exception of the things around what precisely happened when um, David or George displays Asquith. That's because it's very hard to explain without specific dates. Um, you need to make sure you get the specific evidence to illustrate what I'm saying um, in for your reading. This is focused on the broader arguments, not the specifics. Otherwise, these will go over an hour long, and um, that would be unseemly. So, this question can be divided into three completely separate questions. The first one will look at how good was Asquith as a war leader. The second one will be around the leadership um, race, or well, this race, the leadership bloodbath, um, where uh, who is to blame for the fall of Asquith and Rise David Le George. And the last one, which is amongst the rarer, is will be focused more on what David Lloyd George did as war leader and how good he was. So what we are going to do is this is going to be a mega long one when we focus on all three. Now in reality I've got to rush through it a little bit because this software only works for an hour long video and anything longer than an hour and YouTube gets angry at me. So I, so we will brush over certain ideas and we will not cover all the details here but we will focus on the ones which are hopefully less evident. There should be a lot of stuff unsaid which should be fairly obvious to you. So ask her first things first. Obviously he's become Prime Minister from 1908 at the end of Campbell Bannerman. Although he's made his name as a new Liberal, that is only relative to Campbell Bannerman, who is certainly not a new Liberal. And in reality, he was just as conservative in many ways as the um, Gladstonians. Now this, to some extent, was because of his ideals. He would certainly, although believed new liberalism, was not as fervent a supporter of it um, uh, than David Lloyd George, etc. However, it's also due to his temperament. He is relatively conservative, he's relatively cautious, and he doesn't like making too much change, and his belief in government is still fundamentally laissez-faire. So therefore, he um, doesn't really push the ideas of new liberalism in any meaningful way, and so if you see a lot of reforms, it's actually from David Lloyd George rather than him. He's certainly not against it, but he is reluctant to really push it. And again, this is much about his personality and his sort of languid approach to the government making and it is to anything else. Um, and also, as time goes on, this, his resistance to new liberalism comes almost as much of his deep distrust of David Lloyd George. And his personal hostility of David Lloyd George means that he is almost very reluctant, almost irrationally reluctant, to engage in anything which is vaguely new liberal because he sees that as something that David Lloyd, Lord, Lord George wants. So because of this approach, he very quickly becomes, because he is the yin to the yang of um, David Lloyd George, becomes associated by his own party as the last bastion of Gladstonian liberalism, even though actually personally he's quite sympathetic to new liberalism. So we are going to judge Asquith first, the first of three questions. Now, we are not going to judge him as necessarily a prime minister, although you can make that distinction. As a prime minister, he is X. As a war leader, he is Y. That's a nice distinction to play around with. But we are I'm really focusing on the idea of how is he as a war leader? Because when you are asked to judge him, there'll be things which say, oh, yeah, look at this, this is, this is good. Oh, look at this, this is bad. And to add a bit more depth, you can show, well, that's good, but not in a war leader. An ability to be cautious is good as a prime minister, but not as someone who is involved in the total war. And the important thing to realise, and these are the, this is how we judge individuals. We've mentioned this before, so hopefully you shouldn't be new to this, so I won't explain it. Um, what we are looking for is in the context of a total war. A total war is the one of the, this is the first time there's ever been a, a war of this scale. War is not about grand battles and then the war's over. It's about m mobilizing as much as of the resources and e uh, efficiency of the country in order to hurl rocks, men, rocks, men, shells, bullets, etc., at a faster rate that they than your enemy can. This is not a war won by individual acts of valour and battles. This is a war won by slogging industry, throwing against each other until one side is exhausted. And so for this, you need to be a particular type of leader. Okay? Um, you need to be a leader who is economically, um, so politically um, unified. 
because of the sheer demands, the sheer amount of work, the casualties, the, the requirements of the state, the, the economic effects of a total war, it is very easy for countries to become divided, become there for their political problems that we mentioned last time. Therefore, a good war leader at um, uh, a good war leader is able to uni unify the country despite this effect and actually gain and keep support for the war because wars on total wars are not usually lost unless it's world war what two um by s grinding all the way through until there's no one left <clears throat> they are usually lost when the one like they are in world war one when the um one side's population can't bear the troubles can't bear the privations can't bear all the economic and social and political damage and therefore demand peace from their leaders usually kicking their leaders out as what happened in both russia and in germany in 1918 as part of the november revolution economically because total war is about throwing as many men tanks shells lives into the enemy at a faster rate than they can you need to make sure that all your natural resources all your factories all your population and all your infrastructure railways etc are being used as much and as effectively as possible to help support the war militarily as well you need to make sure that the armies are fighting it um, really effectively now this is the most controversial because very often prime ministers are not generals and so they do not really understand the specifics of war so there is one school of thought which says a good prime minister leads to the generals because the generals know what they're doing um, the counterpoint to this is actually this is a brand new war the generals who are gen commanding world war one are used to small-scale imperial old style wars they are they don't know what the hell they're doing essentially and therefore it takes a prime minister to get rid of ones who are bad and replace them ones of good i.e like a manager of a football or rugby team look at me using a sporting reference um i.e the manager does not play rugby and we're not going to play football but no, does not play rugby but they are good at managing um the the front row back row etc 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 and making sure that they they have the bright people in the right places who know what they're doing okay so is the um uh the uh, prime minister a absent parent and that's fine because they the they everyone knows what they're doing or is it a very effective manager who doesn't directly control the war but make sure the team is good and the team knows what they're doing and the team works together um so we are going to judge whether Ashcroft manages this and the answer is no he doesn't so he's bad but just so we are aware, this is what we're looking at. Now, when we want to um, be nice to him, we can say, well, what was his aims? What was his context, etc., etc." But even when you consider that, it's not going to be great. So remembering that Gladstonian liberalism is the idea that the state is bad, the state corrupts, the state is not an efficient way to run resources. Actually, if you leave it to private individuals, private businesses, people know what's right. And actually, it's undesirable, therefore, the state to get involved. This is fundamentally opposed to what you require for a total war. A total war requires the government to get involved. It requires government to actively solicit and ensure unity, either through propaganda, censorship, and making deals with people, including people you don't like. It requires the government to massively get involved in running the economy to make sure that p businesses are getting involved in the right way, businesses are making the right things, people are treated nicely, and thus they don't rebel, and that the armies don't know what they want. And so you can argue it is impossible for someone to be ideologically pure and fight a total war if they're a Gladstonian liberal. And this, arguably, is the problem with Asquith. He is not intrinsically a bad leader in that he makes poor decisions, but he is not a leader who is ideologically suited to a total war. He is unable, uh, he knows the options, but because of his ideology, because of his values, he does not follow through. Now you can say it's a bad thing, but also is a man sticking to his values is that bad? You know, it swings and roundabouts, but you need to pay attention to this idea that it's not simply him trying to be a total war mystic getting it wrong. It's him being conflicted between the demands of a total war and his own personal values about how the country should be run. So what happens, and we're going to go through the specifics of the what what, what events happen, but after a couple of years after a year of just the Liberal government being in charge, um there are increasing problems and pressures on the government. Um, as we will look in a second, and as you will research, um, 1915 is not a great year for Asquith. 1914 is fine, um, it's short enough, uh, the BF is massacred on the fields of um, 
Belgium, but they are, in, and they stop the Germans, and it's not so bad. But 1915 is the point in which you need to make a transition to total war. 1914, you've got enough weapons built up, enough soldiers, but by the end of 1914, they've all been shot, and they've, well, all the bullets have been shot, all the shells have been used, um, and all the BEF, the British Expeditionary Force, the regular army at the time, are either dead or far lacking in numbers. So there needs to be a step up. And essentially, Ashcliffe fails, as we shall see, to make that step up. Step up. Um, the, the, and therefore, he is blamed for the, um, a lot of mistakes and the problems in the war. For example, there is a shell crisis where private businesses are unable to provide the, sh the weapons, the shells for the artillery in enough numbers um, to help fight the war. Artillery, for those who aren't aware, are big guns which fire shells, um, which are usually the size of a small child. Um, across over many, many miles, land in the enemy trenches and blow them up. Obviously, with them being so inaccurate, you need to have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of shells firing 24 hours a day to hit anything in any way, shape or form. But in trench warfare, it is the only way to make sure that the people who are walking across the front no man's land probably aren't going to get machine gunned. You can, the only way you can, you can soften up the enemy's trenches and mean that the people who are attacking the trenches are less likely to get massacred is by just lobbing bajillions of shells at them. So... That, and also the Gallipoli crisis, which we'll talk about, starts putting him under pressure. Um, as well, as a result, the no Lord Northcliffe, um, who owns the Daily Mail and the Times, becomes increasingly um, critical of the government's effectiveness. Northcliffe is patriotic. He is not against the war, but he's saying the government isn't doing enough to run the war. Okay? Likewise, toy backbenchers ignore their front bench. This is important. Spooky, ominous sound. Um, for the first time, really, and start criticising um, the government's record, again, not in running the war. They like the war. They're very patriotic. The reason why the front bench, the, the leading Conservatives, say don't attack the Liberals is that they don't want to discourage the Liberals from fighting. They fear the Liberals will give up fighting soon. So if they attack the Liberals too much, they'll give up quicker. Um, but despite that, the Tory bench just start attacking the government. So what he decides to do is in order to make it so that um, those groups, particularly the Tories, are less likely to criticise him, he invites them to join a coalition. The logic here is if the people join, if the other parties join a coalition, they and their supporters will be more reluctant to criticise the government. Because the government, although it's still run by Asquith, will be also a coalition government with the Conservatives and they'll be criticising themselves to some extent. Okay, so he invites the other major parties into coalition. He sells it as national unity, etc., etc. And between 1915 and 1916, we have the coalition government. People get confused because there's another coalition government under Lloyd George. This is the Ashcroft coalition government. It's still important to realise, though, that although this is in theory coalition government, this basically means nothing. Um, the, part, the positions given to liberals. Chancellor, war, munitions and foreign affairs are the most important parts of government. The, Labour, um, the Conservatives, Bonner Law is given the Colonial Office and Balfour is given First Lord of the Admiralty and basically in charge of the Navy. They are fine, they are minor, but they are not central to running the war. And Henderson, the, the only Labour representative, is given education, which during a war is largely pointless because you're not allowed to make any real changes. So again, these are token posts. And as you can see, uh, Asquith is thinking he's being very clever. He's bringing people into the coalition but control, retaining control. But all this means is these groups have, are, fit, are getting increasingly frustrated and feel like they don't actually have a say over po government policy. And this means they start getting annoyed at Asquith. So the coalition is designed to stop there being attacks on Asquith, and temporarily they do, but they do not help bind, bind the other parties to be loyal to him. Now, arguably, had the other parties been in charge of the chance of the wars, except um, the war office and the munitions, etc., they'll be less likely to carry on blaming him for problems in the war, and therefore stab him in the back in 1916. But because Asquith is a little bit too much of a control freak and doesn't trust the other parties, he does not give them the posts. 
So what does ASCII government look like and what does it do? There is a huge amount of pros and cons. You need to specifically read these and look them up in your own time. The Shell crisis, for example, is an, the best evidence of how his laissez-faire approach to government, i.e. the government shouldn't tell private businesses what to do, fundamentally fails. The big private businesses are too inefficient, um, too motivated by profit, so that the shells are made poorly, are made slowly, and are made at far higher cost than they need to be, and therefore there's a limited amount of shells. Gallipoli is an interesting one. Gallipoli isn't Asquith's fault, it's Churchill's fault. Churchill is the one who pushes it, Churchill's the one who really demands it. But interestingly, even though um, Churchill takes the blame for this, he stands up in the House of Commons and takes the blame, in reality Asquith is still blamed for this rather than Churchill. And this is perhaps evidence, not necessarily of Gallipoli is Asquith's fault, but that Asquith has lost the support and the confidence of the majority of MPs, including some in his own party, and therefore they are far they're keen to blame him rather than the more popular new liberal Churchill. Churchill, who is a man who's although a new liberal, has contacts in the Conservative Party because he used to be one. Um, the therefore Gallipoli is interesting that actually it's not his fault that the, that the thing is a disaster, but he takes the blame anyway because he is increasingly politically distrusted. So we can argue actually is the problem Gallipoli why Asquith falls and Asquith's government is weak, or is it the fact that it does not have confidence? Asquith has not managed to unify the political system and therefore not kept confidence. Now, arguably, he fixes the shell crisis by making the Ministry of Munitions, and that does sort it. But is that his success, or is that the fact that David Lloyd George runs it really well? And arguably, it is the fact that David Lloyd George runs it really well. And arguably, this fixing it only proves to the other Tories and other Liberals and other Labour Party that David Lloyd George is better than Asquith. And although that fixes the crisis which hurt Asquith's government, arguably it helps them get removed from power because it just proves to everyone that actually David Lloyd George would be a better leader than Asquith. So when David Lloyd George rocks up and says, I want to be leader, they all kind of go, yeah, that sounds better. So even them fixing it harms him to some extent. Um, again, the broad thing looking forward is the um, coal mines, the railways, the various armament industries, they all fail to mo really make enough weapons quick enough, efficiently enough to a high enough quality. Um, because, again, he is unwilling ideologically to tell business and, and nationalise businesses and tell them what to do. Nationalise basically means the government takes over. In addition, as time goes on, the number of casualties... Um, Increase. This is a war of attrition. The strategy taken by um, the generals is to run men and machine guns until there's an, there's, they run out of bullets or there's enough men getting in their law of averages and law of numbers. Um, Asquith, because of his new liberal approach, does not want to correct or challenge the generals on this clearly quite destructive strategy. Um, and therefore, the generals sort of just run this attritional campaign, which causes massive destruction, massive death, a massive lack of confidence at home in the government's actions, but he doesn't really do anything about it. Another great example of um, Asquith's um, near sort of semi Gladstonian laissez faire approach damaging him is the conscription debate. The Tories are massively laissez faire until it comes to war, and war trumps laissez faire. So, conscription is the ultimate battle for laissez fairness, i.e., can the state make people sacrifice their lives, i.e., by fighting in a war, against people's will? That is conscription. Or should it rely on individuals to be, have the right to volunteer? Now, Asquith holds on to the idea of banning, not having conscription by having a volunteer force, well past when it was clear that doesn't work. And this really alienates him, weirdly, from the Conservatives. The, Liber um, the Labour Party is actually kind of against conscription, but as we shall see, keeps it quiet because they want to stay politically popular. Um, Asquith doesn't have the same level of sense, and therefore really holds off it. And the Tories, because they are more focused on the war effort and winning the war and the patriotism, glory, glory, hallelujah, compared to the, uh, the esoteric arguments that, well, it's someone's right to choose their what their destiny is, blah, 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 they really start getting hostile at him about this. And even though he eventually gives in, the damage is done to his political reputation. And you can argue that the conscription debate really contributes to his fall. Additionally, you can argue that inherent to all this story is the fact that although he's built a coalition, he hasn't built a coalition. He's got officially a coalition of ministers, but a coalition requires trust, 
it requires leadership and it requires people to believe and support the government. And quite clearly, particularly as time goes on, Ashcroft is not very good at getting the confidence of the other parties or even his own party. And his sort of detached, hostile, suspicious um, and distant demeanour does not endear him to the other parties in the coalition and does not endear him in any way, shape or form to other groups within his own party. And this will help contribute to his fall. And finally, his leadership style, as mentioned, is distant, quiet and cautious, as he was uh, perhaps unfairly described by A.J.P. Taylor, as solid as a rock and like a rock incapable of movement, i.e. a man who does not make a decision. So therefore, he is increasingly alienating the key groups in government, the Tories, um, significant elements of his own party, and even the Labour Party, who is technically meant to be socialist and pacifistic, although it's not. Um, that, combined with the, the setbacks and the problems you mentioned, mix is to provide a deadly cocktail for Asquith. Essentially, he has not made many friends. He's a sort of loner in the corner. And, at the same time, his government is mucking up. Combine this with the fact that the Conservatives just want the war to be won, and the Liberals want the war to be won, and strongly believe that the way you win it is by increasing the role of the state, these two groups naturally look at Asquith and drift away from him. Now, if Asquith had been this bad, but the war was going really well, then arguably he would have survived for longer. If the war had been going badly, but he was very good at making friends with the different parties and making them feel that, like they're being listened to, Arguably, they'd be less likely to stab him in the back. But because the, both these things happen in combination, the Conservatives feel like the country is being let down by him and they start agitating for change, the Liberals the same. And so what we can argue is actually these are, this is the element, these are the reasons why we start seeing the toppling of Asquith. So when we look at the question, now we've moved on to the second question, by the way, um, of how, why does Asquith um, get kicked out, we really want to focus on is Asquith himself to blame? because he was not a great war leader, that's what everyone mentions, but also he was not very good at managing his coalition partners, and he is ultimately stabbed in the back by his coalition partners, and David Lloyd George would not take power if it wasn't for his coalition partners. So therefore, quite clearly, his failure to control his coalition partners is a significant weakness. So, that's strange. Um, so, what happens in the end? And this is where we, we're going to break down this individual parts of the story to try and help us understand who is to blame for the toppling of Asquith. So before we move on to that, very, very quickly, if we're going to summarise uh, Asquith in government, he is a nice man, but he clearly, if you look at the failures and what the government is doing, and you need to have a specific example for that, he is not capable ideologically or in terms of his character in really meeting the demands of the... Um, war, i.e. he is a great war leader, but not, uh, sorry, a great peace leader perhaps, but not a very good war leader. Arguably, there's an interesting argument um, by a guy called um, uh, Marwick, no, not Marwick, apologies, uh, Morgan, whose uh, sort of arguments around um, uh, David Lloyd George is that essentially he's the exact opposite. He's a brilliant, his character is fantastic for war, but in peace it actually just angers people and makes him, um, his fall somewhat inevitable. So, what happens next is controversial. There are two arguments, and everyone gets this wrong, okay? There are two arguments, okay? Well, in reality, because there are two arguments, there's one in between, so it's free. Argument one, advocated by people who dislike David Lloyd George. David Lloyd George wants power for, for power's sake. He only cares about power, and he actively agitates in order to get control of the, of the government and stabs um, uh, Asquith in the back by organising a rebellion against Asquith. That's argument one. Argument two, it, and that assumes he's, uh, uh, David Lloyd George is, is to quote um, Sykes, destructive in his arrogance. Um, argument two, this is the David Lloyd George supporter argument. David Lloyd George is a man who is brilliant but frustrated by the leadership of Asquith, and ultimately, in um, which he believes will fundamentally lose Britain a war, and in frustration, he resigns. Um, and there, because his sentiment is shared by majority of people in the government, um, he is followed by most of the government, and then becomes, by his natural greatness, the natural successor for leadership. Argument two. 
Argument three is a combination of both. This is basically says Asquith is not very good. This, so, so by the way, so argument two assumes that Asquith is not very good. So it agrees with argument two. It says Asquith is not very good. And David Lloyd George does genuinely think he would run it better. But at the same time, that comes from a point of arrogance. And he does, therefore deliberately agitates to get rid of Asquith. So it's got elements of both. Asquith is to blame because he's not very good and he loses support. David Lloyd George does kind, isn't just being cynical. He does think he can run it better. But at the same time, he is stabbing him, Asquith, in the back. And that's in reality, like all middle grounds in our sort of postmodern world, is the one which is most accepted. So what, how can we see this playing out? Okay. Um, he proposes to Asquith that rather than having a cabinet, which is seen as too slow to make decisions, there'll be a free man war council who run the war effort with free men who know each other. They can meet every day. They, there's fewer discussions. It's very quickly easy and easy to vote. And decisions which are essential for the war effort can be made quickly. OK, there's less confounding going to discussion, etc., etc. If you've ever had a meeting with more than 10 people, it's an absolute disaster. Um, this says that it will be chaired by David Le George and Asker will not be part of the committee. Now, you can see here, perhaps this is being designed to do what, like typical David Le George, it's a win-win for him. If Asker says yes, then um, they, 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 Lloyd George has a basically huge amount of power. And what is the point of having a prime minister in a war if he's not in charge of the war? And basically is an honorary position. If Asker says no, then uh, as David Lloyd George will paint it, David Lloyd George will say that Asquith is bit undermining the war effort for his own arrogance. And so clearly this is a win-win. And it is clearly inflammatory to tell the Prime Minister that you are, he, he shouldn't be in charge of the War Council. Now David Lloyd George tries to pretend it's you know, an innocent thing and actually the Prime Minister is still important. But how is the Prime Minister still important if the war is being run by not him? Um, so what he does is he approaches Edward Carson, who runs the Unionist. Chamberlain's dead by this point. Um, and Bonner Law to agree to this um, and actually do the proposing of it. Okay, so they propose it, and Asquith agrees to this. This shows the Asqu the weakness in which Asquith um, is held, um, is believes he's in, and ultimately the, the fact he's being beleaguered from all sides, he temporarily agrees to this. So argue this ends here. So argue at this point, technically. No one is really to blame. Asquith being reasonable, David Lloyd George technically isn't being backstabby. So you can argue things are going well. What happens next on the 4th of December is where it gets quite contentious. So the Times run a story which publicised the agreement and attacked Asquith. Okay? And so this was designed to almost massively weaken Asquith's authority. By attacking him and saying there's this war council, um, it makes it look like this was forced upon him, which it was in reality, but that makes him look weak. His his, he, what he would have preferred to happen was Asquith announces it and he looks like it's his idea and therefore he looks very strong or at least less weak. Now, interestingly, Northcliffe, the, run, the person who ran, run, Lord Northcliffe, runs the Times, is a personal friend of David Lloyd George, and Asquith suspects where, who else knew about this war council, um, and therefore just suspects that David Lloyd George leaked it. Okay? Now, he suspects one or two things. Historians disagree. Number one, he suspects that either David Lloyd George leaked this, because remember, like, it takes a long time to actually print things these days, so David Lloyd George leaked this expecting that Asquith would not agree to it. And therefore, this was designed to pressure Asquith into agreeing to it, even though he had already agreed to it, but David Lloyd George, when he leaked it, didn't know that, David Lloyd, um, that Asquith would, would agree. Alternatively, it, it was seen as an attempt to politically damage Asquith, who had agreed to it, but make it look like it wasn't his idea, make it look like he's forced into it, and therefore weaken the authority of Asquith. So what Asquith does is somewhat irrational. He takes back his acceptance. Okay? He sees this as a power play by David Lloyd George, um, being manipulating behind the scenes, and so therefore he rejects the War Council. David Lloyd George resigns in protest. So now David Lloyd George sells himself as a martyr. David Lloyd George just wants to win the war. He wants to bring your son back home alive. But Asquith is being selfish, is being greedy. 
The Asquith, which is responsible for Gallipoli, he's not really. The Asquith, which is responsible for the Somme, he's not really. The Asquith, too, which is responsible for the Shell Crisis, uh, more so. Um, he is standing in the way of winning the war and getting your son killed. And this is like classic David Lloyd George. He's playing the angles. He's playing the angle. He's playing the moment. He knows how it looks and how it sells to the public. Con particularly because Asquith is unpopular and Lloyd George is popular with the press. So things will naturally help and be sold on his light. Asquith then panics, well not panics, and this Asquith thinks, well this is now, he's now having his leadership attacked. Now if he carries on in government straight away, these attacks will continue. But he can silence his critics. If he silences critics by resigning, then there suddenly being no other government who can be formed because the Liberals still have the majority. And then being asked back by the king to be prime minister, that would once and for all prove that he has authority. That would once and for all show that, shut up his rivals and show, basically call David Lloyd George's bluff. So that's what he does. He resigns. Unfortunately, while Bonner Law, out of loyalty, quote unquote, says he will not join a new government unless Asquith is part of it, David Lloyd George had made friends with enough senior backbench Tories, and if you remember, the 1910 elections meant that there's only a majority of one or two Liberals, um, senior backbench Tories, to support them, as well as a number of, lay, um, of Liberals who are new Liberal, so the status ones who want to increase the status of the state, and curiously, as well as Labour, who did not like Asquith, and saw David Lloyd George, who's remember the man who brought all the reforms, as and who, who in the Ministry of Munitions, made good friends of the unions and showed himself as someone they could deal with, um, they believed that David Lloyd George would be better to place to help the workers than the distant Gladstonian Asquith. So they all joined together and make a new coalition government. And so what's happened here is Asquith is miscalculated. And therefore, while Asquith resigned, David Lloyd George rocks up and goes, oh, OK, I'm in charge. Now, you can take one or two views about this. Is this an innocent play by David Lloyd George? I think there's too much. Now, David Lloyd George is a... If you, if you assume that David Lloyd George is a deeply intelligent man, and the ask of his deeply intelligent man is to a lesser extent, um, then there's too much circumstance, and it's, everything's a bit too convenient for it to be an accident, uh, but you never know. Asquith certainly has made mistakes here, agreeing, then disagreeing, then faking resigning is all poor errors which lead to the um, end of it. Miscalculating his relationship with the Tories, etc. Again, like it's not, it's all very amateur hour. So if we are going to blame, we'll come back to how it affects in a second, if we are going to blame people, we can say argument one. Okay, David Lloyd George is to blame for the full rules of Asquith because he personally engineered the fall because of his greed and ambition. It's avarice. Okay, this is the very much the sort of standard line. Now, the sources will mention this, but the sources will also have David Lloyd George is responsible because he genuinely thinks that the war is being run badly and he therefore needs to um, take over. Now, in reality, if you do not spot that some source might argue one and the other source argues the other, you will not do well. Look out for this distinction. Now, in reality, the answer is somewhere in between. Gerald Lloyd George does think he can run it better, but he then also does, because of that, stab Asquith in the back. And there is an element of ambition here and arrogance. You can also argue that Asquith's pride... Um, his inability to make friends or with coalition, uh, coalition partners, um, and his inability to come to a negotiated agreement with David Lloyd George, his inability to accept the War Council, although the counter that is, would you accept such a massive dec decrease in your authority? What's the point of being a Prime Minister, if that's the case? It, a more credible argument is, had the Asquith not been bad, he would not have alienated the, work, um, the Labour Party, the Liberals and the Tory Party. That's quite an impressive feat to make everyone rally against you. Um, and because of that, um, he basically gives his opponents ammunition. He gives David Lloyd George ideas and therefore, ultimately, he causes his own downfall. You can also argue that the Tory party, particularly the backbench Tor Tories, and the divisions between the front bench and the backbench, the fact the backbench ignore their leader, although actually many historians say Law kind of knew that was coming, but wanted to take the moral high ground anyway. He very shortly got, joins the new government. Um, the, that, that without those Tories defecting, there just simply wouldn't be the support and the numbers um, to keep David Lloyd George alive. So there would not necessarily 
be that support. But then you can counter that by saying, why, why would they support David Lloyd George? Why would they betray Asquith if it was not for David Lloyd George's personal salesman tactics to them and the fact that Asquith was terrible as a war leader? In addition, you can play the trade, trade unions and labor who do the same thing. They, they make this possible. But again, you can say, why is that possible? Well, it's David Lloyd George being very good at courting them, making, making friends with them, and the fact that Asquith is very bad. So when we look at who is to blame for the fall of this, in reality, there are, um, you cannot escape to some extent blaming Asquith. Yes, David Lloyd George is greedy. Yes, David Lloyd George is certainly ambitious, but it is not as simple as him crassly taking over. There is other factors at play, and fundamentally, Asquith is not good enough for the job. So what are the effects of this takeover? In the short term, it is only good. David Lloyd George is, as we shall see, a better war leader. In the long term, arguably, it's more negative. So, number one, with him, as we shall see, as a better leader, the war effort will be revitalised, it will be much better run, much better organised, and therefore Britain will be better at fighting. Politically, David Lord George is much better at balancing factions, much better at keeping people happy, and therefore we see much more stability and unity. And likewise, David Lord George is much better at understanding how to keep the masses happy and how to balance everyone off. If you remember the last lesson when we were talking about the home front, and about how that kept people happy, most of those things the governments did, the canteens, etc., were David Lloyd George as opposed to Asquith. Okay, rationing and all that sort of stuff at the end, David Lloyd George. So again, in reality, because of David Lloyd George's relatively good leadership, we see the war far more likely to be won. The economy sorted, the political sorted, and the social society is sorted as well. The long-term effects, and we'll dwell on this lots more when we come to the actual lesson about the liberal splits, is the fact that fundamentally this starts a deep split in the liberals that is never fixed. Uh, they do come together once the liberals are pretty much destroyed in the 1920s and 1930s, but now why then it's too late. Ultimately, what happens is Asquith storms out of government, along with his supporters who are mostly Gladstonian, the new liberals rally with... Um, uh, David Lloyd George, and they stay with him, and this division will stay, and this will mean that in the 1918 elections, the Liberal vote will be split and the Liberals will be weakened. Into that void, the Labour Party will step in, and we will see, this is all part of a different lesson, we will see the rise of Labour and the decline of Liberals. It is not as simple as saying this is the only cause, but this is a significant event onto that. And I argue as well, this creates the coupon government. The 1918 coupon government basically is the same government as this new coalition under Lloyd George, the Lloyd George coalition, except for minus the Labour Party. So, um, what is Lloyd George like as a war leader? So you will need to research the specifics of what David Lloyd George does. In reality, they're largely positive. Um, the summary is, all those different examples that you will find can be explained as him being a better war leader. If we remember that a good war leader is someone who can make sure the military fights well, however they manage that. Someone who um, makes sure the economy produces as much stuff as possible, as efficiently as possible required for the war, and quality enough and keeps political unity. We've already seen political unity. He's very popular. He's very good at that. He's very good at negotiating. And as we shall see in the next lesson, when we look at industrial unrest, he basically stops there being any real industrial unrest at all. Um, and as we saw in the previous lesson about the home front, he stops there being too much anger amongst the poor because by making sure the poor are relatively looked after. So essentially, um, he is a much, much more dynamic leader. He massively increases the role of the state in order to nationalise stuff, ration stuff, coordinate stuff, and empower different government agencies to helpfully win the war. So his actions, and particularly economically, therefore, he has a massive, massive success. Um, he also has much more control over the military leaders. This is probably the most controversial. Most historians will say he is vitally helpful for making the economic side of total war work and vitally helpful for the political side. The military side, there is more controversy. Now, the first example, he is very, very, he pushes, for example, um, some very successful strategies. He pushes the use of tanks, for example, which turn out to be quite good. Not a miracle weapon, but quite good. He also pushes the convoy system, and we won't go into too much detail about the military history of it, but this is where you get loads, rather than sending ships one by one and then letting them get sunk, 
um, across the Atlantic. You put them in one massive group and you surround them by British battleships and destroyers. And therefore, what happens is the submarines either don't dare to attack it or get destroyed by the British battleships. Well, destroyers, but now we're getting nerdy. Um, in order to... Um, um, to do so and therefore the, the food supplies are protected. The convoy system massively increases the amount of food, massively therefore increases the cheapness of food and therefore massively helps social stability. And this is his idea and he really pushes this against a reluctant admiralty um, who don't want to waste their um, ships doing those sort of runs. Um, to a lesser extent, he also plays a lot of favourites and interferes a lot in uh, with um, uh, Douglas Haig and his campaign. And Haig absolutely hates um, David Lloyd George. And some historians have said this is too much meddling. That fundamentally, David Lloyd George doesn't understand infantry tactics. And so all he does is cause um, headaches for generals and doesn't actually help them win. Um, he does, however, really push the idea of making sure there's lots of machine guns and therefore by the end of the war Britain is making more machine guns than anyone else um, and, and the average British platoon will have more machine guns per man than anyone else in the rest of the war including America and Germany who have actually much better production bases to start with. Um, as a war leader, as I mentioned, he's very good at keeping unity, particularly the Tories who are the biggest party. He has great partnership with them. They all trust him to some extent. His personality is key to this and also the fact that he is very good at making sure he Pay, looks like he's paying attention to people, even if he's not. Um, as well as this, though, we can point out that he has a relatively easy ride. Germany starts imploding from 19, the end of 1916 to 1917 because the war is taking its toll on it, and actually it is far worse led than Britain, even Britain on Asquith. And so we have a attempted, well, a, a political crisis in July 1917 um, in Germany, and then there's a... Um, Massive starvation in 1918, and the war ends in November um, 1918. So actually, David Lloyd George takes it at a time when the Americans are joining and the war of Germany is weakening, and so the war is naturally being won. So you can say he's quite lucky in that regard, that he does not have to... It's easier to control a nation which is winning a war than control a nation which is losing a war. It's easier to keep people unified, it's easier to keep people happy, it's easier to keep the supplies up if you're not losing. Um, because you won't have to compensate for all those effects. So therefore you can argue actually he's quite lucky. But even then he doesn't muck it up, so let's be quite kind to him. One big thing you can say is he is undermined by the Asquithian rebels. They vote against some of his um, changes he wants to make, which makes them angry, um, and really cements this division between the Asquithian and David Lloyd George's liberals. The Morris debates in particular, which you're going to have to read about in your own time, um, are really, really key to this. And they are seen by many historians, I actually think of it too much, because they do make friends again after 1924, um, as the real split. So after the Morris debates and the deliberate attempt of the Asquithian rebels to destroy David Lloyd George, there is no chance, at least in the short term, of an alliance between the two groups. So in reality, as a war leader, he runs it better, economically, politically he runs it better, although in both cases perhaps he's benefiting from the fact that war is being won. Um, as a military leader, he is good but not perfect. He certainly annoys Haig, um, uh, the, the um, uh, head of the army, um, and uh, he is, put, um, in the long term, actually increasing his division with the Asquithian Liberals and increasing the division at the party. So almost at the expense of the Liberal Party, he is doing well. So, how good he is, is he as a war leader? Well, as mentioned, he's, is he lucky that the war's going well? But is the war going well because he's a good leader? Still swings and roundabouts and he doesn't muck it up, so we can't judge him too much. He is certainly more dynamic than Asquith, which both gets more confidence from the Tory backbenchers and his own party and the public, but also gets more stuff done. He is much better at managing the, the situation politically, keeping the masses happy and keeping the coalition happy. He is, um, as mentioned, his record of generals is less clear. He's good about the convoy system. He's good about tanks. He's good about machine guns. He's less good about managing the generals and telling them what, what to do. Um, and so overall, it's very difficult to argue that he isn't more effective than Asquith, and he's actually quite good. Um, you can say if his aim was to win the war and expand the state to do so, he does this and therefore he is good. Okay. Um, you can point out though, if his aim was to win the war and he helps win the war, how much is it Britain winning the war and how much is it that it is a, the Germans losing the war? Okay. What did he, how much did what he did actively 
you know, make the war end quicker, and how much of it was the fact the Americans joined the war, and that massively helped, and also the French were constantly fighting, you know, a little bit more than the British to the guard, and the um, Germans were imploding. So we can say, it's, it do not basically say he is the sole reason the war was won, because he's not. There's lots of other factors as well. When we do the con context, um, you can argue um, that, you know, any man who's trying to ma major, m run a total war for the first time, this is the first, no one has any reference points about how to run a first total war. Um, so any man who does that, who manages that successfully, deserves praise. And always bear in mind that this is the first time that Britain has done a total war. But you can also balance that by saying, yes, but the war is improving. So it's not like a Herculean thing. It's not quite as good as someone who turns the war around. It's slightly easier to win a war, if, you know, to be a good leader if the war is being won. And when you take over, then if here the war is being lost, because just everything is easier. Okay, there are the three questions. How good was Asquith? He was not very good, but that was more stems from his ideology than his Pataxian aptitude. And he unfairly gets blamed for some of the things. And actually, it's, and that's not his really his fault, but that reflects his political weakness and political hatred more than his incompetence. Question one. Question two, why did, they look, why did um, Asquith fall? Arguably, it was a combination of his own in, uh, in incompetence and pride with David Lloyd George's ambition and genuine belief that he would be better, combined with the fact that he was enabled by the other parties who, because of the incompetence of Asquith, decided they wanted to get rid of him. And how good was David Lloyd George's leader? He was good. Um, but let's not get overboard, there were weaknesses, because this argument is very easy just to say nice things about David Lloyd George, but you really want to explain why. He is good as a total war leader. Okay, that was a, another monster one. I am going to have a break, and then we will get back to the industrial unrest and women, as I recall. Until then, enjoy. We are coming to the end of part one, mercifully. <laughs>